Scripture reading on this Lord's Day comes from 2 Peter, uh, the third chapter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Be reading uh, verses 1 through 13. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Lord, we thank you for your scripture, for your word. As we come today, uh, open our hearts, use your spirit to teach us from your word. Father, apart from that, we cannot know anything apart from your spirit. Lord, help us to keep our minds focused upon you and the matter that is before us in your word. In your name we pray, amen. Last week, we talked about unframable scripture passages. You know, the fact that nobody's going to have a, a 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 up on their kitchen wall. You know, the dog returns to its vomit and the pig wallowing in the mire. And, uh, you know, the graphic terms that Peter uses to describe the judgment that will come upon false prophets and false teachers that they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done, that they will receive the reward of the, unri of the unrighteous. And we said that we need to keep a careful watch on our own lives, lest we stray from the path of righteousness. And Peter re gives us a reminder here, another reminder. If you can remember, way, uh, well, it shouldn't have been too far way back, but it is because of my... Uh, illness or the medical issues. It's been several months ago, so I won't blame you if you don't remember. But when we started Second Peter, we said the key to unlocking it was the first chapter in the 13th verse, where he writes, I think it is right to stir you up by way of reminder. By way of reminder. And now he writes here, uh, this is my second letter to you, and I've written both of them to you to stimulate you to wholesome thinking, as it says in the NIV. So he has this reminder. He wants us to stay in the Word and remind ourselves about the Word. But he has a specific reminder here, verse 2, that the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments 
and the Savior and the apostles. Don't neglect the Scripture. Don't neglect the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's the purpose? To stimulate us to wholesome thinking. The message that Peter is giving us here is um, that it is through the study of the Holy Scriptures, the study of the Old Testament, the study of the New Testament, that our thinking, that by that our thinking will be transformed. Our minds will be changed and transformed. What is it that Paul said? Be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you have to, we have to do it for ourselves. We have to study for ourselves. If you're look, looking to get enough on Sunday morning to make it through the week, you're going to run out of gas by Tuesday afternoon because, you know, it's just not that good. You know, you're going to need to get go, to get into the Word for yourself. You have to be in the Bible recalling and reminding yourself of the Scriptures so that you will think properly. Let's do that. Let's, you and I, be a people of the Bible. That's the only foolproof way that we will be able to stand against the nonsense that's in our world today. It's the only way that we'll be able to uh, confront the heresy that's around us today is to be in our Bibles. Uh, beginning in verse 3, Peter tells us some things that we need to understand about those who oppose us in the faith. Knowing this, first of all, he writes there that scoffers will come in the last days scoffing. I, I thought that was funny. I laughed at that. Well, imagine that, scoffers scoffing. You know, I don't guess it was that funny, was it? it <laughs> but it just reminded me of that, that what they're going to do, it says, they're going to follow their own lust. You know, the scoffers do. They scoff. They say, how can you believe in a God? There's no evidence for him. There's no proof for it. Science is the way to go. You know, survival of the fittest, evolution, this stuff about Christ and his return and how we're living in the last days, that's for weak-minded and uneducated people. That's foolishness. Don't be unsettled by the existence of those kind of people, Peter is saying. In other words, he's saying that they were around 2,000 years ago. And they're here once again. Such people will come, he says, in the last days. A conclusion that many go to here is that because there's so many scoffers here in the 21st century, that we must be in, quote, the last days, meaning that we think that Christ will return during our lifetime. And I understand that position. I really do. But if you look at the scriptures, I think you will discover that we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The last days started with the coming of Christ into the world. And they will end with his second coming, with his second advent. And just as the Old Testament prophets predicted his first coming, he will come again in the same way. He will come personally, he will come visibly, he will come bodily. So you and I are living in the last days. But to clarify, I guess I need to say there will be last days to the last days, you know. But no one knows when that will be. So scoffers will come. They'll follow their lustful desires. They will scoff at those who live a godly life. They will scoff at those who believe in the return of Christ and the coming judgment. And so, and they do so in order to fulfill, Peter says, their lustful desires. They live self-indulgent lives and laugh at those who believe in the return of Christ. And you stop and think about it. If there's no God, there's no judgment. If there's no God, there's no creation. No God, no consequences for your actions. So live for yourself, because this life is all there is. I remember when I was in school, if you wanted to fool around in the classroom, you needed to be sure that the teacher was gone, right? 
There's a teacher. She smiles. She knows that. Got to be sure that the teacher is out of the room. And, if, and you have to be sure that there's no possibility of their return. If they're, if they're about to return, it makes a difference in the amount of foolishness that goes on. Right? Or at least it did when I was in school. But if the teacher took their things, packed up their briefcase or their purse or whatever, and said, behave yourself until the bell rings, I've got to go, that was an invitation for havoc <laughs> to break out in the classroom. Uh, but if you knew that they were coming back, you toned it down if you're going to do anything at all. So if you can convince yourself that they're gone for good, you can pretty well do what you want. So, so long as Jesus isn't coming back, that means there's no judgment. No report card, if you will, to be completed and sent home. There is no event that will call us into account. So how do people convince themselves that Christ isn't coming back and that there's no judgment? Well, verses 5 and 6, for they deliberately overlook this fact. They deliberately overlook the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water, through water, by the word of God and by means of these that then existed was deluged and with water, and they perished. They deliberately overlook it. The truth, they overlook the truth that God created this world. That's what it's talking about. Out of water, through the water, and then he judged it by water. And that he literally rained down judgment upon this earth. The King James says that they are willingly ignorant of these things. They choose not to believe. They choose to overlook the truth that God's activity in the past is an indication that he will come in the future and what he will do in the future. Again, we see here that verse 5 reminds us that God created the world by his word. He spoke it into existence. Verse 6 tells us that by, by means of this same word, the, the world existed and was deluged with water and perished. Verse 7 by the, by, the, by the same word, again, the word of God created, the word of God judged, and by that same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction on the ungodly. The Bible's clear, isn't it? It's clear on the issue of judgment. There's no room for doubt. Verse 7 should call us to tell others about Jesus Christ. If we truly believe the Bible and that Christ will return and that judgment will fall, then we need to tell those we love about the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to them and say, because I love you, I have to say some things. I have to tell you some things. If you die in your sleep tonight, you will face hell. You will face eternal punishment. And because I love you, I can't imagine that thought. Many of us, though, are unbelieving believers, if you will, when it comes to these things. We believe and we enjoy telling people about heaven and that faith in Jesus Christ will take them to heaven. But we don't like to tell them about the other side, about judgment. It's no, it's no fun to talk about hell. So apparently, we don't believe in it if we're not willing to speak of it or else we would tell people about it. And I, I know, I understand, if you tell people about that, about hell, about the judgment of God, they scoff at you, just as Peter says they will here. They ridicule you. You're being judgmental. I don't like that picture of God. I've heard that in the walls of the church. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. He's too harsh. He's too mean. I like the God of the New Testament that's loving and kind. Read the Gospels. The person in the entire Bible that speaks more of and more vividly of hell and the judgment to come than anybody is Jesus Christ. Next, Peter tells us about some things that 
He doesn't want us to forget. Verse 8, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. Now, there are those who like to do the math, and I've even done the math, and they say that this is a literal, Peter's telling us literally uh, what, when it, how to compute time when it comes to biblical prophecy. I think Peter has another point, and it's not just my opinion. A lot of guys smarter than me that I read over the past week, you know, are saying this too, and it makes a lot of sense. It's saying that God is sovereign over time and that his perspective on time is radically different than our perspective on time. Verse 4 again, where's the promise of his coming? You said he was coming, where is he? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. I know all these people that believed in Christ. You know, Uncle Bill's gone. My friend Fred, Aunt Susie, you know, they're all gone. They believed in Christ, and everything's going on. Jesus still hasn't come back. You know, we think all of this should happen during our lifetime. We believe that we are the last generation. You know, and we might be, but we don't know that. God is not on our clock. God is not on our clock. In the past, there have been many people who have set a date for the return of Christ. And I just did a quick Google search, and there's somebody who has set another date as, uh, uh, on January the 18th of this year. They set a date. Uh, Rabbi Yosef Berger says that Jesus will return in 2022. I go, well, why 2022? Well, it seems that he's been looking at a star system with, you know, this name by a number longer than my arm, so we're not going to go into that. But in that star system, two stars are supposed to collide and have an explosion that's so great that it can be seen with the naked eye here on earth. And then he quotes Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but now... Uh, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. I read that, and I thought, that's pretty weak. <laughs> that's pretty weak. But there'll be people who believe it. <laughs> there I am scoffing again. That's right. <laughs> you know, good point there. But uh, the, the idea here is, is that Jesus will return at a time of his choosing not ours. He's very clear about these things. He said, concerning that day and concerning that hour, not even the angels of heaven know. He makes it clear in verse 10 that the day of the Lord will come, will come like a thief in the night. You know what time the thief's coming? Do you know? You, you just don't know, do you? A few years ago, somebody... Uh, got into my garage, stole two chainsaws and some other stuff, and got scot-free away with it. And, you know, I went inside and I checked my answering machine and there was no message. No message from the thief, no encoded, you know, encrypted thing that I could figure out how they got there. I checked my text, there was nothing on my text. You know, they, they were just rude and they come unexpectedly, you know. But we still ask the question, don't we? Why is the Lord waiting? God, why are you taking so long? Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Once again, we see God isn't on our clock. The Lord is, isn't, is not slow to fulfill his promise, the way we look at slowness. You know, you're sitting at that traffic light, and how long is it taking? Forever, right? That's taking forever, or you're waiting on a friend. You're sitting in the car, they're supposed to be coming out, you know, and it's honk, 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 honk on the horn. What's the matter with them? Where are they? Don't they know we're going to be late? Or the place that I have found that I believe I'm going to be when the Lord comes back, the place on this earth, on this planet, where time passes more slowly than any place in the world, the doctor's office. In the waiting room. It's eternal. Amen. Why are you being so slow? What's the hold up here? 
I was sitting at one, and one guy, buddy, he just had it. He got up and bawled the nurse out and left. I thought, man, you must not be too sick, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, to do that. But you, what we have to, another, something we have to see here is that God's slowness is a purposeful slowness. He has a specific design in view. That's why, that's why he hasn't returned. Look at the last half of the verse, verse 9. God is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Same truth, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Now that's an interesting thing here. We refer to Jesus Christ as our Savior. Look at how Paul writes it there. God is our Savior. We don't want to dive into the Trinity right now. But God is our Savior, and he does what? He desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, there are a lot of different opinions on how to interpret verses such as, as these. And for your comfort and your encouragement, we will not go into them at this time. But uh, if you want to discuss it afterwards, you know, I'd be happy to do so. I, am, I have been known to talk about theology for hours on end. You know, people say don't go to parties and talk about politics and religion. I'm going, well, what else is there to talk about? You know, so, you know, if you want to discuss this, I'll be happy to. But the bottom line here, I think, is God loves to save people. God loves to pour out his grace and pour out his mercy on undeserving sinners such as you and I. But there will come a day, as Peter says in verse 10, that the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The day of the Lord is coming, Peter says. Judgment is on its way. And if the Lord had come back prior to this morning, all of the people that we were going to talk to about the gospel would be lost for all eternity. So we should be thankful for God's mercy that he continues to wait. He continues to pour out that grace, but we can't bank on that forever because he will come. He will come like a thief. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? You know, uh, Peter doesn't tell us here that we need to figure out the time frame of when Jesus is coming. That's not his concern. Instead, he says, instead of figuring out a time frame, you need to figure out what kind of people you're going to be. How are you going to live? In other words, the compelling issue of eschatology, the compelling issue of the return of Christ and the final judgment, the time when God will wrap everything up, the big issue isn't speculation about Jesus' return with charts and graphs and diagrams or whatever. Instead, the scriptures urge us toward a certain kind of life. What sort of people, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. Live holy lives, godly lives, lives that shine forth with the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we are to look forward to the day of God. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Looking forward to the day of God. Does it say we're waiting for the rapture? It says we're waiting for the day of God. Well, what's the day of God? It's the day when God will come, when Christ will come, and he will wrap everything up. We will move from this age to the age to, that is to come, and it will happen in one great instantaneous moment. It will happen in the twinkling of an eye. God will settle all accounts. He will deal with all the issues. No second chances. No place else to go. Since Peter says that this is the case, when we understand this, when we understand that the destruction of the world and the judgment is to come and the wrath that is involved, surely we will have compassion in our hearts for those who don't believe. And if we're genuinely, in, genuinely interested in looking forward to the day of God, then our friends and family will know that we are. 
Not by our ability to speak about our views of the end times, but by our lifestyle, by our holiness, by our godly lives, and by our zeal for the things of Christ and his church. Peter lays a great challenge here before us, doesn't he? You know, it's easy to say, well, yes, I'm very interested in the return of Christ. Let me tell you how I've got it all figured out. This will happen, and then this will happen, and then that will happen. And if you do, and what you do is this, is you, you take uh, the number that you started with, multiply it by 12, go outside on a full moon, run around the, the building twice, divide that by 666, and before you know it, you'll be under the throne with 144,000 people praising God. And so it goes. And people ask, what in the world's all that about? That's a good question. Excellent question. And they ask because all of that misses the mark of Scripture. Augustine puts it well. The quantifier regarding those who love the coming of the Lord is not those that affirm that it's very close, nor is it uh, among those who determine that it is far in the distance, but it is found in those who, whether it be near or far, await it with all their hearts. Those who love his appearing, John says. Love his appearing. And how will you know if you're awaiting it with all your heart? I think it will stir your soul. It will stir you with the loss of loved ones and friends that don't know Christ. And you'll want to go to them and say, Jesus is coming. And because I love you, I know that he doesn't want to find you in this sort of condition. Next, Peter talks about the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Now, when we talk about heaven, we talk about uh, pearly gates and streets of gold. And uh, I'll make a confession. I've often thought that something was wrong with me because I wasn't excited about the fact of walking on streets paved with gold. I mean, you know, it just, just didn't do it for me. And then as I've studied the scripture and I looked at Romans the 8th chapter, specifically verses 19 through 23, it speaks of the fact that the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Why? Because the creation was subjected to futility. It was cursed there in the garden. In other words, sin not only impacted us, it impacted the entire creation. But one day the creation itself will be set free from the bondage, Paul writes there in Romans 8. And on that day, what will happen? The day that the children of God receive the redemption of their bodies, the world, the creation, will be healed as well. It will be set free as well. All creation, Paul says there, is groaning and waiting just to, for this event to happen. And when you read your Bible about that day and think about a new heaven and a new earth, it keeps us from having what I would call that Hollywood vision of heaven. You know, you're floating around on clouds, uh, playing harps and listening. You know, I, I, I couldn't listen to harp music all day, much less for eternity, you know, for the rest of my life. Instead, God promises something real. He promises to renew the physical universe. Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, they hold out the promise of what is called nirvana. And nirvana is the eternal state of non-physicality, where you're just a disembodied spirit floating around. Uh, biblical hope is radically different. Radically different. When the Bible talks about what we call heaven, it doesn't speak of the removal of this physical existence, but it speaks of, as we just said from Romans 8, its redemption. It's renewal. Indeed, in the final pages of the Bible, it doesn't talk about going to heaven. Instead, it talks about the new heaven coming down to this earth. Then I saw, Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Guess what? Hollywood's wrong. Praise the Lord, they're wrong. Heaven isn't some fourth dimensional place with clouds and halos. The Bible disproves all such notions. Heaven's a tangible place of real existence. It's a new creation. If you don't think that's possible, go outside and look at the night sky. 
get in a dark field and look at the night sky. Go to the mountains. Go to the ocean. Look at God's majestic and carefully planned creation. You know, I think if God did it once, he can do it again. And, you know, what I'm saying, I believe, doesn't negate anything in the Bible. I believe that it fleshes out the reality of a new heaven and a new earth. A place where there won't be any more cancer. A place where I won't be waiting in a doctor's office. A place where there, you know, no more death, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Because the old things have passed away. The new has come. And if you stop and think about it, God is going to do for this old world what he does in the heart and life of every believer. He doesn't throw away everything that you are. Instead, he redeems it. He redeems it. He saves and transforms people. That's the gospel, isn't it? And I found my God to be perfectly consistent. And as we said earlier, God loves to save people. He loves to take the old and make it new again through the power of his spirit and by means of his grace. Beloved, heaven is real. Hell is real. The day of Christ is approaching. Do you know him as Savior and Lord? Now is the time, the scriptures tell us. Now is the day of salvation. And I'm just a messenger. And I hope the message hasn't gotten lost in a, a sundry or myriad of words. But that you have heard the fact that you can be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that you too can be redeemed. God loves to save people. And he would love to save you today. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love to save people. Lord, this word this morning from your word is a hard one. But Father, it is your truth. And it is out of love that you have placed it there. And Father, out of that love, may we share the truth of your gospel with all that we come in contact with. Those that we love in our family, our friends, and our co-workers. That they can be redeemed through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen.